Um, I, I'll tell you right now, this, this was something that I needed this week. Life is crazy. Your life is crazy. We all have stuff going on. And I said, you know what? You're going to study patience. And so since I also preach, haha, you have to hear about it as well. And I hope that it's an encouragement to you. Patience. Lord, help us have patience. My wife sent this over to me. Bless me with patience. Not opportunities to be patient. I've had plenty of those, and they don't seem to be working. The actual patience. Um, yeah, it doesn't work that way, though. It doesn't work that way. Um, God's not going to zap you with patience. And I actually believe that once we have a better understanding of what it is, we wouldn't want him to zap us. With patience. There, there's a rhyme and a reason to it all. Jordan and I used to, to worship with one sister uh, in, in Allen, and she was a counselor. And she was talking about, through behavioral studies, that they, they find, generally speaking, that your first child will take on the personality of the opposite sex parent. So my, the rest of my crew is actually out this morning but so for our family that's that's cadence would take on the personality of the opposite sex parent she's a winner um and and if you know if you know cadence you know that not only does she look like her daddy it's basically just me with long hair but but she does she takes after me and then what they say is that every child after that if you have more children that generally speaking they begin to alternate uh, parents. So Cadence would be like me, Braylon, Braylon would be like Jordan, Jace would be like me, Ainsley would be uh, like Jordan. Now, that's not a hard rule, but it is funny that most people, when I ask them, they'll just say that that's gener generally true with their kids. Um, I had to pull Cadence to the side this past week. She got upset and she was not being patient. And and I understand that this is not unique <laughs> to our children. But, but I, I sat down with Cadence and I said, sweetheart, I said, you know, there, there's a really wonderful thing that God has done for us. And, and our personalities, I said, there's, there's a lot of good things about our personalities. We get excited and, and that means we can be really joyful. And, and hopefully that means that we can be joyful to be around and we can be encouraging. Um, we tend to be uh, sympathetic and show empathy, which is, I think, good. Um, it's really good whenever you're talking to people about the gospel, that they're excited, that they see your, your love and your zeal for the Lord. Uh, but it, it can have its cons as well. And we, we get very excited and very happy and quickly excited and happy. We also get very quickly uh, upset or concerned or anxious or disappointed or angry. I'll just stop it. I won't talk about the other cons. I like to make myself look better than bad. Uh, but there, there are, in all, in all sincerity, there, there are things, I said, Cadence, that you and I have to work on. And, and we got to be patient. We got to calm down. And as I was going through this, this sermon, I thought, what if Jesus had my patience? Some of these, this patience and this lack of patience that I sometimes have shown in my life. And that's kind of a scary road to go down. <laughs> I'll just go ahead and let you know, long story short, we'd all be dead. So there you go. Um, like recently we were reading through, we're, we were in John chapter 8 in the side class. And these dishonest Jews bring this woman caught, into, caught in adultery to Jesus. To trap him. And I thought, you know, what, what if Jesus had my patience at the times, that, that my patience? Uh, what would that have looked like? You know, take two. Teacher, we've caught this woman in adultery. And in the law, Moses says that such women are to be stoned. Whack! And then Jesus, before they can even finish, is already just pelting them with stones. You know, you want a stoning, you got a stoning. That's... That's not the Lord that you want, is it? And you know, like just many examples. What did Jesus do? They continue to question him. He just calmly kneels down, writes in the sand, 
stands up and says, hey, if you're without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And uh, he kneels down and begins to continue writing in the sand. And I think it's, it's interesting, starting with the older ones, they depart first. It's patience. Guys, I don't want Jesus to have my patience. I want to have Jesus' patience. Now, there's a couple things about that. If you're like me, that's, that's a little intimidating. When you look at a passage like Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5, In verse 7, Hebrew writer states, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This, this obedience and this long-suffering and this patience that Jesus Christ had through, through his whole entire time, being ob- obedient did not save him from patience. It was actually through his perfect patience that he was perfectly obedient to God. A couple things about that. Number one, that's intimidating, right? Because whenever you call me to that standard, I, I, I can immediately feel bad because I... I don't rise to the occasion. But can I say this? We have to have that standard, brethren. If we didn't have that perfect standard of patience, who would we turn to? How do we know? What, what would that look like? So we need that standard. But what I also want you to, to take note of, and we'll see this as we go through the study, that we're blessed by God because we have Jesus' perfect example, but we're also blessed by God because He has saved for us these examples of other people that have gone down this road with us, that have also shared in flesh and blood, that did not have perfect patience as Jesus, but were counted righteous by God. And we have them to look to as well. But we do need patience. Um, James chapter 5. This is kind of the, the foundation of our study this morning. James chapter 5. Brethren, sometimes we need patience. Before we jump to suffering, as we often do, we just simply need patience in in waiting. James says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. You know, one must admit, when you... You're reading this 2,000 years later, for the Lord is at hand. <laughs> it's not contradicting what James says, but, but we think through our lens, through our experience, the Lord is at hand 2,000 years ago. You want me to be patient until the coming of the Lord? How long, Lord? It's an un, almost an unintended irony in that passage there. How long shall I be patient? We talk in two years, four decades. Is he going to come back before I die? Be patient for the coming of the Lord. And here's the part that's really comforting. Like the farmer. Like the farmer. This is not something that is out of our reach. You know what I mean? It's not something that that we can't see and understand. Like the farmer. And what does a farmer do? Well, he does his work. We understand that. He labors. But what the farmer has to do is he has to wait. He has to wait on the Lord for the early and the late rains. What happens if they don't come in exactly the right time? What happens if they, don't, if they don't come in? The point is, the farmer waits on the Lord. Brethren, I want to make a really quick point here. You do understand that through this example, that God's watering more than just a field. He's planting more than just a physical field. He's watering more than just a physical field. He's giving growth to more just a physical field. You do realize that he's giving that farmer growth, right? (laughs) That farmer plants seed. God waters it. He gives the increase. Don't you know that God plants seed within you? He was watering that farmer as he was waiting. He was giving increase to that farmer as he was waiting for the physical. 
we have to have and learn patience in waiting. You trust in God, and He will produce. Brethren, do you believe that? Do I believe that? It's more than just an illustration to understand. It's an illustration to be believed, to lean on, to trust with your whole heart. There are other people that understood what it was to wait. I think about John the Apostle. Um, John the Apostle, if we have dated his letters correctly, this man lived for a really long time. Really long time. If tradition is correct, he was also the last apostle to die, dying at an old age. It makes it a little bit more interesting, perhaps, the, the comment whenever Peter was inquiring about John and said, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad, um, abroad among the, uh, the brothers that the disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? I want you to try to imagine just for a moment, try to put yourself in his shoes, in John's shoes, how long he had to wait for the Lord. I'm not talking about suffering yet. I'm talking about just waiting. Brethren, can you imagine having been with Jesus, seen Jesus, and then having him no more? Have you ever thought about that? I know you have. And now John has to wait to see him again? I wonder sometimes how, how long did those days feel. But I do know this, that there are excellent lessons that John learned. Uh, boy, he was the guy that learned patience, right? Son of thunder. Jesus uh, balanced him out. Um, there are a lot of lessons he learned. For example... He learned this, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. John says, I, I, I can tell you this much, that the world is just a, a trap. It's, it's a real snare for us. And... And all these things that it's trying to pull you into, all these snares, all these traps, what I can tell you is this, they're, they're just not going to be here forever. But what I do know, what I've really learned and come to comprehend and believe in, is that those who follow God remain forever. But in order to do that, you have to give up everything. I mean, truly give up everything, all your desires and your cares and your wants, and you got to throw them away, and they have to be fulfilled in the Lord. That's what I do know. And brethren, we have to be very careful. Now, practically, let's talk about the world in which we live. There are a lot of things like with technology. Everything that seems to bless us turns around and curses us. You know, like you talk about vehicles. They're, they're wonderful, and they've helped us in so many ways and travel and and work and etc. But on the flip side, like you have bills, you have maintenance, you have gas, you have registry, right? Registering your car. Uh, you can look at the technology when it comes to computers. Think about all the great things we've been able to do in business. Think about how we've been able to, to reach people with the gospel across the world without setting a foot over there, right? Uh, we have Facebook and all these things we can go to that that reconnect us with people, and, and we're able to share with what's going on. Um, but it also gets us in a lot of trouble, does it not? These things of the world. A lack of patience in a car. Everyone been in traffic in the DFW area? The lack of patience on the computer. Anyone been in some fun uh, political or religious debate on Facebook? That's a fun one. 
Sexual temptation. You think a computer's ever been a problem for someone? I was reading an article Friday where this man was talking about their family went out to eat and their little girl said a, said a prayer for the family. And instead of saying, dear God, she said, dear Alexa. And the family started laughing, and then she got really embarrassed and started crying. But he said, man, it's just, he said, if I don't talk about God to my children, then they're going to learn it from Alexa or from some artificial intelligence. He's like, which, by the way, don't ask her who Jesus is, because she'll tell you that he's a fictional character. A lot of people that, that don't have patience. And, and they're not raising their kids properly. Their families are being neglected. Guys, we, we cannot focus in on the physical and because of a lack of patience and trust in God, start to love the world. Listen, be still before the Lord. Be still, my soul. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in His way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Mom, Dad, all of us, listen. This life is not about being successful in the material world. That's not what it's about. Don't fret yourself over people that succeed, but give up Christ. They have fundamentally missed the mark, I believe. Fundamentally missed the mark. And this lack of patience, again, not even patience through suffering, just the waiting game. It comes with our parenting, neglecting our kids. Is that fair? How many moms and dads are literally on the tablet? Because this world feeds them with a me, 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 now, 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 I must have it now mentality. I, I'm not exaggerating. I've seen it in the church where we have to come in and talk to parents. Literally, you have got to put your tablet down and care for your kid. It happens to us all. This, this lack of pay, our, our whole society, brethren, sometimes I miss the old days of living in Littlefield or even Lubbock, Texas, for whatever that's worth. It's smaller compared to the DFW area. Everyone was just little bit slower paced. They actually, you know, could talk to each other. They actually knew who you were. We become impatient with our children and we send them away. We become impatient in our marriages. You remember the first thing as Paul defines love in 1 Corinthians 13, he says love is what? It's patient. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. And you know, the funny thing is when you go back to the James 5 passage, the next passage says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. The judge is standing at the door. And I think that's kind of interesting. Why does he insert that in that passage? Because I think he knows that whenever people exercise a lack of patience and they become irritable and they begin to lose what they're doing and we begin to turn on each other. I think so. I really do think so. We turn on our friends, we turn on our own family, we turn on each other in the, in the Lord's body, in the church, because we don't have patience. Wait on the Lord, brethren. Fret not, soul, all these other things. The Lord will produce. You can count on that. But, brethren, here it is. Yes, there's also clearly patience in suffering. Listen, this is what James continued to write. As an example of suffering, impatient brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. James says, I'm going to help you with patience. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you an example. I want you to consider something. Remember those prophets of old? Remember what they suffered? Do you remember that? You remain steadfast. You think about these individuals who stood up for the Lord and were persecuted. And brethren, I don't mean to belittle anything we're going through, but I need to say something just to remind us to be fair about this. Whenever James wrote this to the brethren 2,000 years ago, to these men and women, they were being killed for their belief. So let's put this into perspective for a moment. They were being killed. 
I dare say this meant a whole lot more to them than it does to me. And also, let me say this, to be fair, we have brothers and sisters in the world who are being killed today. And many times I forget that. God forgive me for forgetting that. These passages probably mean a little bit more to them. But that's not to belittle the things that we go through. And so God wants us to also understand patience and suffering. But now here comes this interesting statement. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. God wants to help you in patience. Here's what he does. He does it through, through James. He says, there's some things I want you to consider, and there's something I want you to hear. You've heard, you've heard about Job. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Brethren, this is how it works. I'm going to start here. I want you to hear something. You've, you've heard about Job, right? And you've heard about the, the, the purpose of the Lord, and you've seen, you've seen this. The compassion of the Lord and mercy. And we go, I'm sorry, didn't, did you say Job? <laughs> you want me to see the compassion and the mercy of the Job in Job? What? What was the purpose of Job? And I, and I wonder sometimes if, if we have missed the purpose of Job. The purpose of Job was not a situation where there was a man who lacked faith in God and who needed to be strengthened. And so God put him through the ringer so that way he would come out stronger and then God was compassionate and merciful in that he gave him back everything. I'm going to submit to you this, this morning, that was not the purpose of Job. And the reason why I'll say that confidently is simply this. Go back and read Job. That's not what happens. Satan challenges God. And he tells him the only reason why Job is faithful is because you protect him. And God says, not so. And Satan says, eh, so. And there's Job for you. And then the rest is history. And God says, no, what I say is true, so go ahead. Now, did, did Job grow, grow even closer to God through that? Amen. Can we go through suffering to grow closer to God? Amen. There's plenty of passages that teach us that. But that's not Job. And that's a tough pill to swallow for many. And I think that there's more than just the fact that God restored him, his livestock, and his family. Here's where I think God's greatest compassion and mercy comes in, through Job. How many times have you used Job with someone else who's suffering? There you go. The Holy Spirit said, I want you to hear something. You remember hearing about Job? I want you to see God's purpose in Job. Brethren, one of the reasons why we suffer, here's my point. <laughs> yes, sometimes we're just simply needing to grow closer to God. Have you ever considered this, you're suffering for someone else? Job suffered for you in a real sense, and he never knew it. My family's gone right now. The house is quiet. I'm going to confess something to you. Yesterday was awesome. But let me tell you this, if I had to go back home and knowing that my wife and kids were not to return to me like Job and I had to look at their pictures up on the wall, it's a different story. For a woman, perhaps, that wants children, that wants those pictures up on her wall and never has them to look at, it's a different story. And so you tell her about Job and you tell her about the loss and you tell her about suffering and, and now, it's no longer a story, but you understand that you share in the flesh and blood as Job, and now those boils have hit your own skin. And now you saw the first servant say, this livestock's gone, and then the other one, this livestock's gone, and now this wind has come in, and your children are all gone. And we make jokes about, hey, I wish that whirlwind would take, in, take away the kids. Ha, 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 ha. Not funny anymore. Not funny anymore. 
sometimes you're suffering for other people. And God works his mercy and compassion through that. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Paul's saying I, we need to be patient. Why? Because there are those that are idle. There are those that are faint-hearted. There are those who are weak. There are those that want to repay evil for evil. You, you can't, I, I can't, we can't be doing that. So we got to be patient. Paul understood what patience and mercy was all about. Jesus had forgiven him, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as a foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Peter wrote, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is patient. You saw this in the article that Eddie wrote this morning. The reason, literally, brethren, the reason why we're worshiping right now is because of God's compassion and His mercy. He's giving other people a chance to repent. He's giving us more time to share in His holiness. That is what it's all about. Patience in waiting. God will give the increase. He will give the increase. He will produce trust in it. Patience in suffering because he will put you through the fire. And that, that, that heat has to be cranked up. But he will perfect you. Patience in suffering because God will use you for someone else. Ultimately, what are we talking about? Using us so that others may come to be used by the Lord. <laughs> to know the Lord. So whenever you go to work tomorrow and Miss Debbie Downer or whatever is in the next cubicle, not our Debbie, not our Deb, definitely not her. But whenever you're whenever you're next to that person and they treat you unkindly, remember that the suffering in your practical day to day or whatever the scenario may be, your suffering is important because whenever she gets hit with the loss, whenever the boils come to her body, you know what she's going to be looking for? Someone who's steadfast. Someone who's patient. Someone who stays the course. Someone that can direct her. And God, thank you for using us in such a manner. And so, brethren, join me this week, if you will. Here's our challenge. And it could be summed up, I believe, nicely in Romans 12. 12. We're going to find joy and happiness in this life, even with all the turmoil and all the fun stuff that happens, we are going to find real joy and laughter and happiness in this life because there's a hope set before us. And we are going to be patient in tribulation. And brethren, just as important, and you know that the farmer had this when he was waiting for the rains to come in, we are going to be constant in prayer. I cannot truly be patient and lean on the Lord if I'm not talking to him. Amen? Hey, brethren, are you talking to God? Brethren, are you talking to God? How often do you talk to God? How much do you trust in God? Don't tell me you know him if you're not talking to him. You don't know me if you don't talk to me. Don't tell me you know him if you're, if you're not talking to him. Don't tell me you trust him if you're not talking to him. You found a good group here at Melrose? Friends, what does that have to God, got to do with anything if you're not talking to God? You say you're growing whenever you're not in His Word and talking to Him? Just because you have friends here doesn't mean you're a friend of God. Brethren, I'm not trying to say that to be harsh. I'm actually saying that to wake us up if that's the case. Because if that's the case, we're leaning on the wrong people. We need to be rooted in Christ. I hope this has been an encouragement. Brethren, truly, I hope this has been an encouragement. The Lord is here for you. If we can do anything for you at all to encourage you through this road, Lord, help me with patience. Help us all with patience. Please bow with me. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We are thankful that we can come up, uh, before your throne of grace.
And Father, we do ask you for patience, patience in your word, patience and trust towards you, knowing that you know all things perfectly. Father, forgive us of our lack of uh, confidence in your way, the power in your word. Father, help us to love each other here at Melrose uh, thoroughly and, and truly and love those around us. Father, help us to lock arms no matter what we're going through to, to trust in the process. Father, we pray this to your son's excellent name, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. It's your invitation to come to the front if you need to as together we stand and we sing.